Hi, beautiful friends of Bookish Fam. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new here, welcome. I'm so glad to have you. And if you are a returning subscriber, I always appreciate your support. Thank you so much for returning to another video. Today we are here to do my mid-month November wrap-up. I have missed you, my friends. By the time that this video goes live, it will be about two weeks since I posted anything on my channel. I did mention in my November TBR that I was planning on pulling back somewhat from November content just so that I could focus more entirely on my grad course and get as far ahead as possible. And that way, when it was time to start filming and editing for Bookmas, I was going to have a lot more time and opportunity to get that done. And so far, I have been successful. But I did know that meant that there would likely be a couple of weeks where there was no content going up on my channel. For that reason, I wasn't really planning on doing a mid-month November wrap but also I wasn't planning on doing one because the midpoint of November has fallen in a very awkward spot. Y'all know that I'm typically only able to film on the weekends and so November 15th which is actually the day that I'm filming this is a Wednesday and I had today off because I had something else that I was supposed to be doing but those plans got changed so I thought what the heck let me go ahead and just film a mid-month November wrap up because it's the perfect time because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to film this until November 18th and by that point by the time that I got it edited and uploaded it would have been way closer to the end of the month than the middle of the month and I didn't feel like that made much sense. So ultimately I was going to scrap the mid-month wrap-up this time and just do an end-of-month wrap-up but it ended up working out where I could film this. I do realize that that means that there are now going to be back-to-back wrap-ups on my channel because my October end-of-month wrap-up went up slightly late. I apologize for the wonkiness of the content in November but everything is going to be getting on track very very shortly and you can prepare for all of the content in December with Bookmas. And now that all of that's out of the way let's go ahead and jump into my mid-month November wrap-up because I do believe I have seven or eight books to talk to you about today. So the very first book that I picked up in the month of November was Just Another Missing Person by Jillian McAllister. I read Wrong Place, Wrong Time by Jillian McAllister earlier this year and I really, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the way that she used time travel throughout the story and so I was very excited to pick up this newest release from her. And I will be honest that this one didn't quite do it for me like Wrong Place, Wrong Time. However, I do not know whether that was a me thing or a book thing because at the time that I read this, I was still at the very tail end of the slump that I had been experiencing for at least half of October and I was only just kind of coming out of it. And so I don't know if that hindered my enjoyment of this at all or maybe this wasn't what I was expecting I'm not sure I did ultimately enjoy this book overall it just wasn't quite what I was wanting it to be so this book follows our main character Julia and she is a detective and she gets called to the case of a missing girl named Olivia Olivia was seen on CCTV footage going into a dead-end alley and never coming out nobody knows what happened to her and Julia is supposed to go kind of find Olivia and find out what happened to her however there is another character in here that has other plans he knows that Julia has a secret Julia did something last year to help her daughter and this guy is threatened to expose that secret unless Julia frames somebody for the disappearance of Olivia. Now, Julia is completely against this. She is a by-the-book cop. She is incorruptible. She is unbribable. But now that she knows that her and her daughter's futures are at risk, she doesn't really feel like she has another choice. She needs to protect her daughter. And so she's going to go ahead and frame this boy for Olivia's disappearance. And so she's kind of having to toe the line of doing her job and acting like she's trying to find Olivia and find the person who took her. But also she knows that she's framing a potentially innocent person for this crime. So she, I'd say, is one of the main perspectives but there are also two other perspectives in here. I don't really want to say anything specific about those two perspectives because I do feel like finding out who they are is part of the journey of the story. Their perspectives are told in somewhat of an unusual way. So Julia's perspective is told entirely in third person but the other two perspectives are told in second person. So you don't necessarily know right off the bat who's speaking and you don't know who they're speaking to because they're only addressing that person as you. And like I said I don't want to say more about it because finding out who they are and who they are addressing and their perspective is part of the journey of the story. But I will admit that it made for a kind of jarring reading experience, especially if you're listening to the audiobook, because you're not expecting that perspective. And it took me a little while to kind of orient myself to what was actually happening. So I understand why Jillian McAllister made those perspectives be told in that way. But ultimately, I kind of wish it had been done just a little bit differently to make the listening experience a little bit less jarring. And like I said, overall, I really enjoyed this and I kind of enjoyed the direction that it took. I like some of the little twists that Jillian McAllister threw in with those other perspectives. I just didn't find myself as enthralled or engaged with this one as I did with Wrong Place, Wrong Time, but I am certainly keen to pick up more from Jillian McAllister. I will probably absolutely be picking up anything that she writes, and like I said, had I not been on the tail end of that slump, I do believe that I could have enjoyed this a little bit more than I already did. I think I'm gonna settle on a 3.5 stars for this one. I definitely don't think it was a meh read or a forgettable read, but I didn't necessarily have a strong emotional attachment to it. This one was overall good, but not great. The 
next book that I picked up took me completely by surprise and it's probably going to become one of my favorite books of the year, Starling House by Alexi Hero. Honestly y'all, I think that I can credit this book for kind of fully lifting me out of that slump that I just mentioned and nobody is more surprised than me because I went into this book with zero expectations. I had never read an Alexi Hero book before. I had heard really good things about 10,000 Doors of January as well as her other one which I believe is called The Once and Future Witches or something like that but I really didn't know if her books were for me and so I never really had any interest in picking them up. But then this was a book of the month selection and I liked the vibes of it. It was very much feeling autumnal to me and so I thought that I would go ahead and give it a try. And I am so glad that I did y'all because I really really love this and I was not expecting to love this one nearly as much as I did. So this book is set in small town Eden, Kentucky. Eden, Kentucky is basically a dying town. Nobody wants to visit there and nobody wants to live there and that is certainly the case for Opal. Basically since her mother died she has been in charge of taking care of her younger brother Jasper who is 10 years younger than she is and she is desperate to get Jasper out of Eden, Kentucky. She does not want Jasper to be stuck there his entire life like she is bound to be and so she is doing whatever she can to get him out. Eden, Kentucky was basically a coal mining town and after that kind of went kaput it's not really known for a whole lot of things except for Starling House. Starling House was originally built by Eleanor Starling who was a reclusive and eccentric woman back in the late 1800s and she actually wrote a kind of disturbing children's novel that ended up getting pretty famous but not until Eleanor Starling kind of disappeared. Nobody ever knew what happened to her but her children's book went on to be like a very notable publication and that's really all that Eden, Kentucky is known for is Starling House. And as long as she can remember, Opal has been fascinated by Starling House. She has actually been dreaming consistently of Starling House since she was about 12 or so years old. And so she's always felt kind of a connection to it. She passes Starling House every day on her way home from work. And one day she stops and she ends up in a conversation with Arthur Starling, who is the current ward and resident of Starling House. And Arthur actually offers Opal a job as a house cleaner because Starling House is kind of falling apart. It's decrepit. Arthur is not taking care of it. Somebody needs to look after the house. And he plans on offering Opal a lot of money to do this. Opal is not really sure why all of this is happening, but she can't really turn this opportunity down because like I said, she is desperate to get her brother out of Eden, Kentucky. And so she takes the job. And so you're following her as she's kind of getting to know Starling House. Now, as you can imagine, Starling House is definitely its own character in here. It is a somewhat sentient house. It has its own thoughts, its own emotions, and it tries to influence things to the best of its ability. And Starling House wants Opal there. And Starling House is going to do whatever it can to keep Opal there. And so you're following her as she's getting to know the house, as she's cleaning it, as she's fixing it up. And she's kind of learning what Starling House is and why it exists, why it was built by Eleanor Starling in the first place. And you're also following a developing relationship between her and Arthur. And when I tell you that the love story between them was probably better than many of the actual romances that I've read, I sincerely mean it. I was so invested in these two and their relationship and I just really enjoyed following the progression of the story. This in all honesty is one of those stories that really just catch you off guard and make you fall in love with reading again. And I know that that sounds kind of dramatic and maybe it is. I don't know if this book just found me at the exact right time or it was exactly what I was looking for. This was just a darkly whimsical fairy tale-esque story about a tortured brooding young man who has a destiny basically and he feels like there's no way out of this destiny and then the strange girl comes along and kind of helps him through it and it was just wonderful. Now I will say that I am not a fairy tale person. I don't like reading fairy tales. I don't like reading fairy tale retellings. I definitely get lost in a lot of that whimsy and the abstractness of fairy tales and so there were parts getting towards the end of this book that kind of lost me a little bit because I wasn't able to fully understand or connect with what was happening but ultimately I still felt like this was a very well put together story. I really enjoyed the direction that it took. Everything for the most part was pretty much perfection. I loved the vibes of the story. Like I said, I loved the love story between Arthur and Opal. I just really enjoyed almost everything about this and so I gave this a 4.5 and this was truly a standout gem not just of November but for the entire year. The next book that I ended up picking up was Finley Donovan Jumps the Gun by El Casamano. This is the third book in the Finley Donovan series by El Casamano and I'm happy to say that now that I read this I'm officially caught up in the series although I do know that a fourth book is coming out next year and if you're not familiar the Finley Donovan books are just a fun good time. They follow of course our main character Finley Donovan and she is an author of romantic suspense and in the very first book you meet her and she's going through a very difficult time. Her husband has left her for another woman so she is a single mom of two kids. She is struggling to keep up with all of her responsibilities. Her car is falling apart. Her house is falling apart. Her kids are absolutely nuts and she's struggling to kind of write her next novel and one day she is in a Panera Bread with her editor kind of going over the plot of what she plans to write and the woman that is sitting next to her kind of mistakes her for a hired hitman and so she approaches Finley in Panera and says hey my husband is a very bad man and he needs to be taken out and I want to pay you to do it and of course Finley thinks that this woman is crazy and she tries to say hey I'm not a hitman I don't know what you're doing but I'm not the right person but this woman will not take no for an answer and Finley is kind of curious so she goes to stake out this man and she determines that he is a really bad man she really doesn't have any plans to do anything about it but because of wacky circumstances that occur this man actually ends up dead 
head anyway in the back of her van and it kind of goes from there. And all of these other books, even though they're not necessarily directly related to the storyline in the first book, they all kind of take off from there. Because of that, I don't really want to say too terribly much about the third book. But of course, you're following all of our fantastic main characters. You're following Finley. You're following Barrow, who is kind of Finley's sidekick, who also takes care of her kids and is also her accountant. And Barrow is definitely heavily involved in the events of the first book. And she's kind of all down for this hitman side of Finley. Like she wants Finley to kind of get in on it. You're also following Finley's ex-husband and a cop that she is potentially interested in dating. There is just a lot of good fun times happening in these stories and I enjoy my time reading them immensely. I do still think that the second book is my favorite but I did definitely really enjoy three and I am certainly excited to read four when it comes out next year. Next I picked up The Measure by Nikki Ehrlich and this is a book that is set in modern times but it is actually somewhat dystopian because in this time in this book one day everybody wakes up and no matter where they are in the world a box arrives to them and within this box is a piece of string and all of the strings vary in length and it is quickly determined that the length of the string is directly correlated to how long the recipient is going to live. Only people 22 and older get these boxes and so everybody going forward on their 22nd birthday will be given one of these boxes. Nobody knows where they came from. Nobody knows why. Nobody knows how whoever is sending these boxes knows when the person is going to die. It's very very ominous and strange and of course there's a lot of stuff that goes along with that. You can choose to open your box or not and then you have to figure out kind of what you're going to do with the information. Like if you have a short string what does that mean for you and how are you going to handle that? If you have a long string what does that mean for you? Because you obviously know that you're not going to die for a very very long time but that doesn't prevent you from consequences right? If you jump off a cliff you might not die but you're still going to break a lot of bones and be in a lot of pain. This is obviously a very fascinating concept and it's also one that's going to make you think heavily but it is also a very political situation because you can only imagine that the government is going to have to get involved here because there's going to be mass confusion and mass panic and indeed that's exactly what happens in here and it's very kind of reminiscent I feel like of kind of what happened with the COVID-19 pandemic. When we are scared and when our survival is kind of at risk we panic and we do crazy irrational things in order to survive and I feel like Nikki Ehrlich portrayed that very well. She kind of depicts how different governments might handle the situation so like there are like some totalitarian governments that are like you must immediately open your box and report your string length or you must not open your box and surrender your boxes um, and then of course you know a lot of people are very concerned about short stringers. They view them as unstable and there's a lot of prejudice against short stringers like they're prevented from getting jobs and all of this stuff and it's also a question of should they be given medical care if they go into a hospital because they're going to die soon anyway why waste these resources so there are a lot of thoughtful in-depth complex questions that Nikki Ehrlich makes you think about with this story and I think that she did it very very well and overall like I said it was a very fascinating concept and it was extremely well written it was also narrated by Julia Whalen and y'all know that she is an audiobook narrator queen and you really can't go wrong with her narration for some reason though I just didn't necessarily emotionally connect to the story. Now we are following the perspectives of multiple people. I don't remember offhand how many but I want to say it was probably at least seven, seven to eight different characters. This was absolutely a character driven story so I do feel like you're given a good amount of time with each character but there was just something that prevented me from fully emotionally connecting with the story overall. I did give this a four stars because like I said how could I not? It was beautifully written. The concept was incredibly unique and thought provoking. It was complex. It really truly made me wonder what I would do in this situation and it also made me kind of like appreciate how accurately Nikki Ehrlich was able to portray how we as humanity would react if something like this actually happened. So I'm definitely going to leave it at a four stars. This is definitely one that I do recommend if it sounds of interest to you because I do think that it is worth the read. Next I ended up picking up Never Lie by Frida McFadden and I read The Housemaid a few weeks ago and I really really love that story. I am excited to read the sequel to that and it really put Frida McFadden on the map for me. So I was excited to go ahead and get into another one of the stories and this is following Frida and Ethan, they are newlyweds who are kind of in search of their forever home. They want to settle down. They want to build a family. And they are given the opportunity to go out and view the home of a psychologist by the name of Dr. Adrian Hale. Now, Dr. Adrian Hale actually disappeared three years prior to the events of this story and nobody ever knew what happened to her. And her estate has just kind of been sitting empty ever since. And so Trisha and Ethan decide to go out there and view the estate. But they're going out there in the worst time. It is upstate New York. It is in the winter. There is a blizzard and they kind of get stranded at this estate. But luckily, you know, the place is still furnished, the electricity is still working, so they are not in too terrible shape, but they have to stay there until the roads clear. And Ethan is instantly in love with the home. He loves the space, he loves the feel, he loves the decorations, but Trisha herself is not so sure. She gets a very bad, ominous feeling about the house. She does not want to be there. She kind of feels like there is somebody in the house with them, and so she is not having a good time. In order to kind of keep herself entertained, she is exploring one day, she is looking at a bookshelf, and all of a sudden she finds
finds a secret room. And within the secret room is all of the taped sessions that Dr. Adrienne Hale had with her patients because she worked out of her home and she recorded all of her sessions. And so Trisha starts listening to all of these taped sessions and Trisha kind of becomes really obsessed with Adrienne's story. She wants to find out what actually happened to Adrienne. And as she's listening to some tapes with some of the specific patients, she thinks that she might be able to start figuring it out. So you're following Trisha as she's doing all of this. And then you're actually also following Dr. Adrienne Hale in the past three years prior in the months and weeks leading up to her disappearance. And I'm going to say that I actually really appreciated Frieda McFadden in this one because I was fully convinced that this was going to be a mediocre predictable read. And I'm pretty sure that McFadden did this on purpose. She made you believe that the story was going in one direction that was so completely obvious. Like I was frustrated with how obvious it was. I thought this was a situation where I knew what the twist was going to be. And so I was actively frustrated at Trisha, the main character, because she wasn't figuring it out. She wasn't putting it together. But then Frieda McFadden took this into a completely wild and different direction. I started to predict a little bit about it towards the very end. I started to piece a couple of things together, but even still, she took it in a further direction that I did not see coming. And so I really appreciated that. I didn't necessarily connect to this one as much as I did The Housemaid. I had to suspend my disbelief a little bit about it. These people are out there. They're in this home that they're supposed to be seeing. They're trapped there overnight. And then all of a sudden a secret room is found with all of these recorded tapes and all of this stuff is happening and all of this stuff is still there in the house. And so there was definitely some suspension of disbelief that had to happen in order for me to fully get through and enjoy this story. But it really was a journey. It was a roller coaster. And that's what I really appreciated about it. I always say that a thriller doesn't necessarily have to have a shocking twist in order for me to enjoy it. I've been reading thrillers for so long that it takes a lot to actually shock me. But what I do appreciate is how we get from point A to point B to point C to the very end. And if they can take me on a journey, that's what I appreciate. And McFadden certainly did it with this one. So this ended up being a four stars and I'm pretty pleased with it. Next, I picked up The Book of Lost Names by Kristen Harmel. This is a World War II historical fiction that is primarily set in early 1940s in France. We're following our main character, Ava. She was born and raised in Paris, but she is a Jew. She has a Jewish mother and a Jewish father. And this is coming at the time of German occupation and Germany is basically going up and rounding up the Jews. And one night she and her mother are actually caring for some neighbor's children when Ava hears the Nazi police basically knocking on her apartment door and taking her father. But luckily she and her mother are safe because they weren't at home at the time. And so in order to keep her and her mother safe, Ava forges documents to get them out of Paris into this very small town that's kind of bordering on Switzerland. Now, Ava's mother is not happy about this. Ava's mother wants to be back in Paris. She wants to get her husband back. She's not happy that they fled, that they've run away, that they're basically changing their name and they're hiding. But Ava knows that this is what her father would want. And while she's in this small town in France, she ends up becoming part of the resistance as a forger. Because this little town kind of borders Switzerland, which is a neutral territory, there's underground resistance movements that are taking kids who are in similar situations to that of Ava herself. They are kids who have lost their parents. And so in order to keep them safe and in order to keep them out of Nazi hands, they are being funneled across the border into Switzerland. But in order for them to do this, they need forged papers. And so Ava becomes a large part of this town's resistance to get those kids across the border into Switzerland by forging documents. And so it is about her journey of becoming a forger. It is about the relationships that she builds while in the resistance. It's about her trying to help her dad as well as help her mom. So there's a lot of emotional things going on here. There's a beautiful love story. And one thing that's very, very important to Ava is she does not want these children's original identity to be erased. She wants these children to be able to go back and figure out who they were and where they belong. And so there is an old book in the church where she's doing all of the forgeries and she uses the Fibonacci code sequence to kind of hide the names of these children within the book. And that is the book of lost names. We're also getting Ava in the present perspective. I, I want to say it's probably like in the 2000s at some point and her book of lost names is discovered in Germany. They're following her as she's flying back to Germany and she's being reunited with this book for the first time. And overall, this was just a solid historical fiction. I feel it's not a topic that I hear covered too terribly often in like resistance stories. You see a lot about women spies and things like that, but not necessarily forgers. And so I appreciated that viewpoint. This didn't quite hit the spot for me in terms of historical fiction though, if that makes sense. Like this wasn't one that really blew me out of the water. It wasn't really one that made me cry or tear up. Although I did really, really like the ending of it. It is something that I would recommend. I do plan on picking up more from Kristen Harmel in the future. I have another one of her books already on my TBR and I've read one previously. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and settle on a 3.5 for this one. It definitely was very well written. And like I said, I enjoyed the story overall, but it just didn't have the oomph that I probably would have looked for in it. So probably a 3.5. And the last book that I finished so far in the month of November, one that I actually just finished yesterday, The Lonely Hearts Book Club by Lucy Gilmore. So this was actually kind of an impulse purchase. I was at Barnes and Noble searching for some other things and this was their fiction selection for the month that I went. And I thought that it just sounded very charming and heartwarming. So I decided to go ahead and pick it up. And this essentially follows Sloane Parker. She is a librarian. She loves 
her job. She's very, very good at her job. And there is a patron at the library named Arthur McLaughlin, and he is the definition of a curmudgeon. He is a bitter, cranky, miserable old man, and he wants everybody to be bitter and cranky and miserable. He scares absolutely everybody. But Sloane, even though she's a very timid person, she avoids confrontation at all costs. She doesn't back down from Arthur. And so she and Arthur kind of have a back and forth over a couple of months as he goes in every single day at the same time. And Arthur really enjoys these interactions, although he's not letting anybody know that. And then one day, Arthur doesn't show up and he doesn't show up the next day. And Sloane gets really worried about him. And so even though she's not family, even though she doesn't have any personal ties to him, she goes to his house and she finds that he's not in a very good state. And Arthur is very glad to see her. Although again, he's not going to let anybody know that. And so Sloane kind of takes it upon herself to care for Arthur, who really doesn't seem to have anybody else. But slowly other people start trickling in and becoming a part of Sloane and Arthur's life. And they kind of build this really strong found friendship group that actually surrounds a book club. So this story is definitely a lot of things. Yeah, I would definitely say that it's a grumpy sunshine love story, but not in the way that you normally would expect. Arthur is definitely the grump. He is the curmudgeon. And Sloane is the ray of light that is exactly what he needs to show him kind of what he's been missing in his life by pushing everybody away. So you're getting that. This is absolutely a love story to books as well, because Arthur was an English teacher for many, many years. And Sloane is a librarian. And of course, they're all centered around this book club. So there's a lot of talk about books and literature and quotes and things like that. That is a big part of this book as well. And like I said, there's a very strong found family aspect to it. And this was exactly as sweet and tender and heartwarming as you might ultimately expect. I had a really good time reading this, but again, it just lacked some of the oomph and the punch that I was looking for. So even though I did ultimately have a good time reading this, I think I'm only going to settle on a three stars. I don't think that this is going to be something that sticks with me. Um, This could be another instance where there were just so many different perspectives and I would have preferred it to be for maybe one or two perspectives, but I do understand why it was written that way because Lucy Gilmore wants you to have the full picture. She wants you to have the full perspectives of everybody who is so important in the story. I also don't necessarily think that this was long enough to have so many perspectives, but at the same time, I felt like it was too long. I was at the 50% mark in the story and kind of wondered why I was only at the 50% mark. So it was a little bit slow, a little bit draggy for me. This should have been something that really checked a lot of my boxes because I really love found families. I love strong friendship groups. I love character driven stories, but for some reason, this just did not check the box. I think I'm going to give this a three stars. I don't know. I feel like it deserves more, but at the same time, I don't know if I'm going to remember anything about this in a couple of days. So I think that's what we're going to go with. All right, everybody, that is it. Those are all the books that I've read so far in the month of November. I am pretty pleased with what I have read so far. I've been able to complete almost my entire TBRs and I still have half of the month to go. So the world is my oyster when it comes to what is next. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of the books that I talked to you about today and what your thoughts are. I would love to know. Or if you've made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, go ahead and leave me a book emoji just in honor of some of the book related books. I love seeing your emojis down in the comments. And I don't know if you know this, but it helps me and my channel so, so much with the engagement and it helps push my videos out to other people. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I aim to post one video a week, sometimes two, depending on what I can do. And I would sure love to connect with you in one of those next videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which I always leave linked down below along with the books that I discussed in this video. But until next time, guys.